Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Gene Bose, Northwest Center President and CEO, and I'm very pleased to welcome you today to recognize the history and the legacy of Washington House Bill 90, Education for All. Before we get started, here are a few housekeeping items. First, today's event is being interpreted for us in American Sign Language by Amy Harris. So thank you, Amy. We are also offering live post captioning to turn on live captioning, please open up the chat and click on the link that's provided there. Uh, also, we are broadcasting in Spanish. There is a translation logo that'll be on the screen as well. that You can select the language from there. Next, the link, this uh, meeting is being recorded and we're going to distribute this content to the news media in Washington to help drive awareness around inclusive education. For everyone who's not a panelist, you're automatically muted and your camera is off. However, we do welcome your questions. We'd ask you to submit the questions to the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. And we've allotted time later in the program for the panelists to answer your questions. And lastly, if you have technical issues, please use the chat feature to alert us. Uh, you can email Anna Nelson or Jason Sears at the emails that you see on your screen. Okay, I wanna begin today's event with an acknowledgement of the people on whose land we meet today and on whose land One Northwest Center operates across the country. In the Western Washington region, we're on the traditional land of the people of Seattle, the Coast Salish peoples, which touches the shared waters of tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. In Spokane, on the traditional land of the Spokane people, in Omak, on the traditional land of the Okanagan people and the Colville tribe. In Idaho, on the traditional land of the Kalispell, Salish, Coeur d'Alene, and Palouse nations. And finally, in Arlington, Virginia, we're on the traditional land of the Powhatan, Monacan, and the Cherokee. We honor these and other tribes who are connected to their shared history of the regions, both past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and these tribes. We're committed to being better listeners and learners and to lifting indigenous voices. One way we do so is by acknowledging the National Indian Education Association or NIEA, which was formed in 1969 and fought for many of the same rights as our House Bill 90 authors, access to equitable and quality and individualized education. So you can visit NIEA.org to learn more. Next, I'd like to share a quote from Dr. Tara T.J. Stewart. We acknowledge that much of what we know of the United States today, including its culture, economic growth and development has been made possible by the labor of enslaved Africans and their descendants who suffered the horror of transatlantic trafficking of their people. We are indebted to their labor and sacrifice. And we must acknowledge the tremors of that violence throughout generations and the resulting impact that can still be felt and witnessed today. Finally, we want to acknowledge that today, May 25th, 2021, marks one year since the murder of George Floyd. This remembrance underscores the need for all social justice organizations to continue the work of bringing true equity and inclusion to all people of this country. Thank you. The legacy of Washington House Bill 90, Education for All, is tied to Northwest Center thanks to our founding mothers, Janet Taggart, who is with us here today, and the late Cecile Lindquist, Evelyn Chapman, and Katie Dolan. 
These Seattle moms were told that their children didn't belong in school, church, or the community, and that they should be put in institutions. And those mothers, rightly so, stood up and said, our children can learn just like every other child. So they started Northwest Center in 1965 and realized quickly that they wanted to help other children. So they wrote House Bill 90, which passed in 1971, a moment captured in the photo that you see now. It became the national blueprint for IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which continues to impact every zip code in this country today. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce three people who made history on May 25th, 1971. First, Janet Taggart, one of Northwest Center's founding mothers and author of Education for All. Janet and her late husband, Phil, were inspired to work on behalf of children with disabilities by their daughter, Nada, who was barred from attending local schools as a child. Once Janet and the Education for All team got House Bill 90 passed, she went on to help write national disability education legislation. Janet's daughter, Nada, passed away in 2018. But as you'll see today, Janet remains just as passionate and advocate for the rights of people of all abilities. And we're so grateful to have her here today. So Janet, welcome. Next, I'd like to introduce Bill Dussault. Bill was a second year law student at the University of Washington when Northwest Center's founding mothers recruited him and his classmate, George Brack, to help write a bill that would give all children the right to an education. Now, not only was Bill welcome for his legal knowledge, he also owned a VW van, and they used that to ferry the team between Seattle and Olympia as they lobbied for their bill to pass. Bill went on to found his own law practice and has devoted his entire career to disability issues. So welcome, Bill. Okay, finally, please welcome the Honorable Danny J. Evans. Dan served three terms as the 16th governor of the state of Washington, from 1965 to 1977, and as United States Senator representing Washington State from 1983 to 1989. As governor, Dan founded the country's first state-level Department of Ecology, which is the blueprint for today's federal EPA. He's a strong supporter of the state's higher education system. He founded Washington's system of community colleges, and from 1977 to 1983, he served as the president of the Evergreen State College in Olympia. Dan has a close connection to Northwest Center. His cousin, Cecil Lindquist, was one of our four founding mothers. She and Dan were cousin to Tommy, a little boy with Down syndrome, who just wanted to go to school, like all other kids. Dan advised the Education for All team on how to best shepherd their bill through the Washington State Legislature, and he signed the bill into law 50 years ago today. So Dan, Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Okay, now I'm gonna turn the mic over to one of our moderators for today's panel, Emily Miller. As Chief People Officer, Emily oversees our human resources and recruiting departments, as well as leading our communications team. Emily is a passionate advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and she founded the Northwest Center Equity Committee in 2015. So welcome, Emily. Thank you, Jean. I hope I'm, everybody can hear me okay. Maybe Jean, give me a thumbs up. Do I sound okay? Yep, you're good. Okay, perfect. <laughs> it's such an honor to be here today with all of you joining us remotely, and especially to be here to speak with Janet Taggart, Bill Dassault, and Senator Dan Evans, who in a very real way changed the world for people with disabilities. Janet, Bill, and Senator Evans, I will be asking each of you about that experience. And to begin, I'd love to start with Janet. I just want to make sure Janet's mic. There we go. <laughs> Janet, it, uh, it's quite a pivot to go from being a mom to a beautiful little girl to founding a school for kids with disabilities to changing the law for all kids with disabilities. Can you tell us how did the idea of writing a law first come about? Well, the notion that something had to be done uh, came from uh, many parents who were gathering together to form the uh, our very first, uh, we call them church basement schools. And uh, uh, we had the children who were rejected by the Seattle public school system. Well, 
in our, at the beginning of our little basement schools, we spent our time waiting for children, for our children to complete their, their classroom work and by going to a nearby cafe. So this was a gathering of mothers, the first gathering of mothers. I mean, there, there are lots of firsts in, the, in our whole you know, history, the first time we did. But the very first thing were the, the mothers who were gathering at this little cafe where we were complaining about the uh, barriers. And some of the barriers were in policies. Um, often the obstacle was a person. And we, uh, we all agreed that the person who personified the rejection of our children was the uh, director of special education for the Seattle Public School System, who had the authority uh, to accept or reject any child's entry into the system's programs. And parents supplicants, and that's what we were, found that visits to his offered to his office offered uh, no hope for consideration since no information or document nor date was require, required for entry or rejection. Simply the opinion of this administrator could open or close the door to the public school education that we were seeking. And as a result of that dictatorial method of choosing students for entry, he became the target of loathing and an identifiable, identifiable enemy to, who, who served as a symbol for parents seeking an education for their children for good or for bad, that's what happened. And it's the cohesion of this, uh, this enemy that brought together the uh, Mother's Club. And that Mother's Club became a very effective lobby for the education for all bill when that the time came for us to do that. So that I think could, I think we would classify that as the very beginning of, uh, of our efforts to pass a law. Thank you. The forming of a common enemy often does do that. <laughs> Thank you, exactly. Janet. Unfortunately, uh, it, it, you know, it labeled one person, but uh, he served, he served his purpose. purpose. <laughs> Absolutely. My next question is for Bill DeSoe. Uh, Bill, when the education for all passed in 1979, you were in your second year of law school. Here we are 50 years later and you with a long career focused on disability law. Uh, we'd love for you to give us a brief uh, outline of what House Bill 90 covered and what you can tell us about any major laws or initiatives um, passed since that time. Uh, thank you. Uh, House Bill 90 was a relatively short bill, only 13 paragraphs long. But at its foundation, it was a civil rights bill. We wanted to recognize that children who experienced disabilities had a constitutional right to education in the state of Washington. That's in fact where the education for all name came from, Article 9, Section 2 of the state constitution. It was the first bill of its kind in the United States requiring that all children all children, no exception. Educators would say, you mean them? You want us to include them? We said, yep, all of them. They all had a right to an education and that was one of the foundations of the bill. Secondly, they had a right to an appropriate education. One that was designed around their specific needs. Those two together formed the foundation of the law. Zero reject and appropriate content then we coupled it with the right of the superintendent of public instruction to sanction school districts who didn't do it right. The, the idea that the state could punish districts who didn't do it right was unique. It was a transfer of power in the public education system on a massive level from educators to parents who knew children best. And in that regard, it formed the foundation of the disability civil rights movement in the United States. Just as Brown versus Board of Education in 1955 established that 
uh, individuals of ethnic uh, and, and racial minorities had a right to an equal education, so too did House Bill 90 establish the constitutional right of children with disabilities to enter school. We've always used education as the foundation for our activities in civil rights. And once we had the right to education, we went on to the right for transportation, public housing, employment, access in the community, something as simple as curb cuts, all generated from this law. The entire civil rights movement started with House Bill 90 and moved forward through the Federal Education for All Handicapped Children Act in 1973, Title V of the Rehab Act, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act in 1990, which was the successor to the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, and perhaps most importantly, the Americans with Disabilities Act. All of those flow from the efforts of these remarkable four women that changed the world for individuals who experienced disability. And they changed it with all modesty, but with incredible tenacity. My hope now is that it establishes a floor for what we have, but not a ceiling. We have so much more to do. Thank you, Bill. That is so powerful, especially reflecting on everything else that was happening in that time and, you know, in this country. It's, it's just amazing. Um, my next question is for Senator Evans. Uh, Senator Evans, when your cousin Cecile and the Education for All team first approached you about passing a law, what were your thoughts? What kind of advice did you give them? And what do you remember about that process? Well, I remember it pretty vividly because uh, uh, 50 years ago, we were in a deep recession, the Boeing recession, which followed a period of uh, real uh, prosperity. So uh, the legislative session was a difficult one uh, we were just trying to hang on, and um, I wasn't terribly interested in starting something new that would uh, you know, kind of get in the way of our survival exercise that we were engaged in. But uh, Cecile and Janet and their um, the other two women that joined them were a powerful lobby. Uh, and there's, you know, there's nothing more powerful than a true citizen's lobby, people who care deeply about an issue and who are uh, involved in trying to carry that forward. Uh, so uh, the first thing that was involved was my education. They had to really let me know what was happening. Uh, I wasn't very much aware of the fact that so many of our young children were being denied an opportunity to even enter uh, the school system. Um, and uh, they were, when they met with me, they asked me what they needed to do. And I said, well, uh, on an issue like this, you need to educate every single legislator that you can get hold of, uh, because I'm sure that most of them will not be uh, very aware of what you're trying to do. And I thought to myself, boy, that's a, that's a problem. They'll never get it done this session. It'll take several sessions for this to really get in front of the legislature seriously. About three days later, uh, I had a report back from Cecile uh, saying, what do we do next? I said, what do you do next? And I, she said, well, we've contacted every legislator. And I thought to myself, wow, I need these four women on my permanent legislative team because uh, they had done something that I, I don't think had ever been done before. And that was to make 
uh, an intelligent, informed contact with every legislator who was serving. And that's particularly why Education for All was passed during that session. I never thought they had a chance to pass it during the a session when we were facing such difficulties with the economy. But um, one of the proudest days of my life was when I sat there with uh, all of them uh, in, uh, in audience and signed the bill which created education for all. House Bill 90 was uh, a remarkable piece of legislation made more remarkable because it happened in essence so quickly, uh, but it was a dramatic step forward nationally, uh, initiated here in the state of Washington and by a citizen lobby that uh, was volunteer but was really devoted to an extraordinarily important issue. Thank you, Senator. That literally brings tears to my eyes to hear you explain that. It's just beautiful. Thank you. Um, Janet, I'm hoping to ask you another question. Uh, when Education for All was passed in 1971, what did you think things would be like for inclusive education in the future? What were your, what, where did you think we would be in 2021? And how does that compare to what um, is really occurring? Well, I, I expected every child to be able to go to school. Uh, I expected uh, that the quality of the uh, programs would improve. I expected to see uh, early learning, early uh, childhood uh, programs to fit the needs of the children. I consider all of this to, to be, uh, be part of, of today. And, and it pretty much is. I, I need to remind, uh, I think I remind the people close to me how bad things were originally. I mean, our children were denied not only an education, but they were denied uh, the right to medical insurance coverage. They were denied the right to, uh, to attend events, uh, denied the right to go to the church, as a matter of fact. Uh, and, and that's, I, I, let's remember, that's where we came from. So things are better now, but there's still much to do. And I think we have to constantly uh, monitor the legislation that exists and what I would propose to do is to have uh, the idea of beginning a movement nationally. I'd like to uh, see the beginning of a uh, coordinated parent and professional and advocate organization for children with disabilities and uh, make them into lobbying entities based on the model that uh, we use to promote education for all. Um, I would suggest that we have a single legislative issue to promote, to promote annually. Uh, I would like to see it advertised and promoted on an annual legislator's luncheon in each state where tables would be identified by each legislative district where parents and professional people would meet to discuss the uh, agreed upon, the uh, single issue, uh, by the way, that each state group had decided as that year's priority. I'd like to see a system of communication that would be established that promoted that piece of legislation by a single call to a leader who would then lead to a series of calls and communication to other advocates leading to contact with their state legislators. I'd like to see a system of providing national and organized lobbying uh, it could bring a steady growth of meaningful laws and oversight to provide and protect our children. I think it's important to identify political figures, entertainment and sports figures and leaders in any field who have children with uh, uh, disabilities and, uh, and to use the, them for uh, promotion uh, to, to promote beneficial legislation. I think we need a single paid leader who could serve as director of this effort. I think a grant might be available 
to serve as a research incentive to create a plan for this project. And I, in other words, I'd like to see a single issue each year be promoted by each group in each state and uh, that it be monitored uh, regularly to see that it's implemented. I think that the monitoring of our present legislation is very important. And I think uh, this is important that we keep in contact with our political leaders, uh, our, uh, that's, our state, our state and federal political leaders, and uh, that we have a single director to make sure that this is all taking place. But I, in other words, to make a single issue each year and have it coordinated between all the states so that we can, that, that should be a, a powerful lobby. Indeed thank it you. will be. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you, Janet. We need to find um, the, the, another Janet <laughs> with the political savvy. Um, that, that that's not going to be that there. hard. They're out there. I mean, there are still parents parents of children who, who recognize that we have problems and that we need to do something about them. There, there are plenty of leaders out there. Yes, thank you. I agree. Thank you, Janet. So I guess my next question would be for, for, for any, any one of you, uh, Bill, Janet, uh, Senator Evans, what is one thing people in our audience could do to help move inclusive education forward? I'll jump in somewhat quickly on that. Um, Janet hit on a, a really key issue here, and that is implementation. We've got uh, quite a few really wonderful laws on the books that have been passed over the last 50 years, uh, originating out of HB 90. But there are no disability policemen. There isn't anybody out there to make sure this happens, except the people that are directly involved. Individuals who experience disability are wonderful advocates themselves and need to be incorporated in this movement. And that leads to real inclusion. We need to move from a parent uh, organized and structured advocacy movement, which is critical to continue to expand our advocacy movement to include people who experience disabilities themselves. And that brings us to real inclusion. So implementation through inclusive advocacy is where I would go. I think Janet had one of the uh, uh, you know, absolutely important issues she was talking about. And that is, if you can focus on a single issue and get uh, uh, get it really focused on by people and parents and legislators and advocates all across the country, you have built a, an, an enormous tidal wave of support. And I think that that, uh, that would be a key element in making continuing progress uh, and making it pretty regularly. Uh, sometimes it's pretty difficult to uh, focus everybody on a single issue, but uh, to the degree you can do it, I, I think uh, really helps in uh, taking the next major steps forward. Janet, any parting, you've already, you've given us so much, any parting advice for the audience on what they can do to move this forward? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, she, she, I'm sorry. Would you repeat that? <laughs> That's okay, Janet. <laughs> any, any. Sure. I have a hearing problem, but secondly, I was, I was drifting off again. I had some more <laughs> ideas. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, Janet. We were just, we were just wondering if there was any parting advice you had for the people in the audience. We have a lot of people in the audience today, just as individuals. What would you advise from them or parting advice for them to move? I think the most important thing for us to do is to monitor the present legislation and how effective it is. Uh, 
and to stay in touch with our political leaders. So much of what we're doing now depends on the politic, the, the national politic. And we've got to we've got to understand that and we've got to find a way to work uh, with it uh, in order to achieve our goals. It, we have a big job to do. And, uh, and, and a lot of us is in the political field. And I, I suspect that uh, Governor Evans uh, could explain to us how that works, that we need, to, we need to get into the politics because so much of what we want to do has to do with uh, the uh, political will. And it seems to me that one of the, one of the difficulties, of course, is that we have, we're in a time now where, uh, as I've said on a number of occasions, we've given everyone a megaphone. Uh, there, it's not like when I first started, when uh, the written press was the place where everyone got their basic information and news. And uh, it's changed. Uh, we've moved, of course, in, in, into television, but we're beyond that now with uh, anyone able to set up their own blog and, and speak out. And some of them have audiences that are larger than uh, any one of the newspapers that used to, uh, uh, used to exist. So um, it still makes the, the single most important uh, advocates, the people, the, the people who care. And that's what drew our success from the very beginning. Uh, it was Janet and her cohorts and Bill and a number of citizens who just cared very much, understood there was a real problem. And their biggest job uh, was to educate those of us who really didn't know as much about the problems that existed as we probably should have, but uh, that still exists. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who um, just on a day-to-day -day basis don't have any um, feel for what the problems still are for the disabled because they, they don't see or hear or understand much about it on a daily basis. So it will always take advocates uh, advocates that were the geniuses behind House Bill 90 and everything that happened after that. Go for it. Um, and we, we've got to have uh, a continuing and growing group of people uh, who as lobbyists are absolutely the finest, the best and the most powerful of any lobbies that appear before a state legislature or a United States Congress. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I, could I uh, mention something? Uh, in the last uh, administration, we nearly lost a very powerful piece of legislation by the stroke of a pen. Uh, I'd like to have Bill address the danger that we had to face losing that and how it was rescued by a uh, member of the Supreme Court. Uh, the United States Supreme Court. Bill, would you describe what that legislation was and, and how it got put into uh, the 14th Amendment? Well, uh, Janet, tell me which one you're thinking of. He said, tell me which one you're thinking of. I'm talking about, uh, 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 who's the, the Ruth uh, uh, Ginsburg, oh, Ruth, yeah, put, that, put it into the 14th Amendment to protect it. Yeah. Um, Justice Ginsburg has uh, actually long been an advocate for individuals who experience disability, writing early on in the 60s and 70s uh, briefs and arguments uh, for uh, civil rights for individuals with disabilities uh, in the ABA journals and in other material. Uh, she's been hugely instrumental in maintaining the support at the Supreme Court level for our bills. Um, one of the most challenging issues facing us is uh, the current division on the Supreme Court that appears to be political and not just dogmatic 
and that political division on the court is, as, as Governor Evans says, perhaps not as educated as they could be to the real world that we face. Justice Ginsburg was educated to that real world and she was able to preserve the rights that needed preservation that came to the Supreme Court and that were maintained through her decisions. Thank you, Senator Janet and Bill. I not only feel more informed about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I did not know, but now know <laughs> even more inspired about focused, intentional effort that we all use our platforms to advocate for this change. Our sincere thanks for joining us today. It was such a pleasure to hear your thoughts and an honor to learn from you and about the passing of education for all. Now, before we move to our next segment, Northwest Center President Jean Bones is going to tell us about a documentary being produced about the passing of education for all. Great, thank you, Emily. Thanks again to Senator Evans, to Janet and Bill for being here with us today. Um, what a pleasure. Uh, next, we're grateful to be able to share with you a preview of a new documentary about the passage of Education for All. This documentary is being produced by Thriving Communities in a project being led by Jerry Milhan and filmmaker Hannah Guggenheim. They've graciously allowed us to share a bit of the film with you today. And so, please roll the film. I, I know that that the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act, which is now the IDEA, opened the doors and it creates the opportunity, like most civil rights laws. It is the paramount duty of the state of Washington to provide education of all children. So the name of our group actually came from Article 9, Section 1 of the state constitution, Education for All. Well, Jerry and Hannah, I think I speak for everyone when I say we can't wait to see the full documentary. For all of you joining today, please visit Thriving Communities to learn more. And for anyone who RSVP for today's event or is on our mailing list, we'll be sure to alert you when the documentary is released. Next, I'd like to introduce the moderator for the next part of our event, Laura Needler. So Laura is our Chief Education and Therapy Officer she leads a talented team of nearly 100 teachers, therapists, family resource coordinators, and support staff to directly serve more than 600 children annually. And by launching programs such as IMPACT, which is training early learning centers across King County to include children with disabilities, Northwest Center Kids now has expanded our reach to more than 21,000 kids. So with that, welcome, Laura. Thank you, Jean. It really is an honor to welcome so many educators and advocates to talk with us about inclusive education today. I'll be asking questions of each panelist individually. One of them, whom we're so happy was able to join us, is Christine Simonich. Christine's expertise in inclusive education includes being a speech language pathologist with uh, Seattle Public Schools and also being mom to Kyle a young man with special needs who received early supports from Northwest Center Kids and also attended our early learning and school age programs. Christine is only able to join us for a short time today, so I'm going to start by asking her a few questions. Welcome, Christine. Hi, thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone. Um, 
Uh, before I um, answer any questions, so I did want to say a, a big thank you, a big thank you to the founding mothers, um, Janet Taggart, Katie Dolan, Cecile Lindquist, and Evelyn Chapman, and then also as well to um, Mr. Bill Dussault and George Breck and um, Honorable Governor Daniel Evans for your work in um, creating and passing, here I go, okay, creating and passing, I always get so emotional, House Bill 90, because my son is in inclusive education in public schools because of you all. And I hope, I hope um, as I answer these questions and I share his experiences with you all, you see what your work, that your work has made a difference and that um, my son would not have the opportunities. Sorry, I tried, I rehearsed this so I wouldn't tear up, that my son wouldn't have had the opportunities that he has now. And it's because of you all. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. We're so happy to be here today. So as a mom to two children, uh, one who happens to have a disability, can you tell us what it was like to have your children at Northwest Center Kids? So it was fabulous for us as a family to have both Kyle and Max at the Northwest Center Preschool Early Learning um, because they were at the same school together and sadly, this, that is probably the only time they will be in school together just because um, Max is an, a typically developing child and he's in, he just, he goes to um, public school down the street, our home school, but that school does not have the program that Kyle is in. He's in what's called a distinct program. And so it's a um, self-contained classroom and um, it's, I believe, eight kids, two instructional aides and one teacher. And unfortunately, they do not offer that at every school. And so um, this being at the Northwest Center was probably the only time they will be in school together. Um, but it was great. They both had teachers that love them. They, they knew the routine. They understood the things of what it was like to go to school. So um, it was fabulous having them at one school at the same time. Great. Thank you. Well, I can say we absolutely reciprocate <laughs> um, knowing you and, and your boys personally. It was such a joy to have all of you. Um, now I'd like to switch gears and just ask, and you, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but how has your experience, you know, transitioning into Seattle Public Schools um, been similar and then been different from your experience at Northwest Center? So truthfully, I feel like the Northwest Center was it was just, I mean, Kyle's and Max's transitions to um, public school was seamless because they under they had teachers that cared for them. They had classrooms. They, I mean, they just knew the routine. They knew how everything you need to do. And so when they went to preschool, they both knew what was expected of them. They both knew, I mean, preschool and public school. That's what I meant. And then on to kindergarten. I mean, just they, they knew the routine. They knew to come into the class, hang up your backpack, hang up your coat, go sit down, sit at your desk and be ready to start the day. And that's what they did at the Northwest Center. And so they, it, it was just seamless. The, the transition really was easy for the whole family. And a difference, um, you know, I was thinking about that and honestly, I, I don't really know because um, Northwest Center was preschool, early intervention for both of them. And so when they went on to kindergarten and um, unfortunately Max had to go to a different preschool just because of moving from Queen Anne to Greenwood. Um, it was, I can't think of a difference for either one of them. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what we want it to, to be like. Um, well, wonderful. So can you, I mean, you have a, a little bit of a unique perspective being a speech language pathologist and also a mom, um, but can you, can you share your thoughts on um, some of the successes that you see in special education in public schools today? Uh, truthfully, I see a lot of successes and it's, you know, thankfully to all these, you know, to these people. Um, for Kyle, he has always been included in, in the general ed, wherever he's gone. Um, and the last school he was at, it was, I was pretty lucky to be at the school with him. It just, it just happened because his program shut down 
at the former school. And then he had to move to the next closest school, which is where I worked. And um, they had buddies for PE, they had buddies for art, um, buddies for library. And what I mean by buddies is this, um, so he was in fifth grade. So his fifth grade class was buddy, was paired up with the gen ed fifth grade class. And they actually had buddies that helped them with PE especially and um, art. And it was great. They had friends and every time they went on the playground, the kids really went out of their way to include them. And I think it was because that particular school has always had a um, distinct classroom. And so it, it wasn't like these kids were different. Um, they were just included and they were part of the fifth grade class. And then another thing I will mention is that in Seattle Public Schools, each kid, even if he's there in a self-contained class, they have a seat in the gen ed. So my kiddo was in a fifth grade class. And I remember the teacher coming up to me um, in the beginning of the school year saying, oh, your, your son's going to be in my class. And I looked at him like, no, my kiddo is in a self-contained class. And he's like, no, 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 he's got a seat in my classroom. And so even though I work for Seattle Public Schools, that was kind of like an aha moment for me. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, I know you have to, you can't stay on for too long, but I want to just really, you know, show our thanks and appreciation for everything that you've also done, not only being here with us today, but you've always been such a strong advocate for your own kids and for all kids. Um, so just thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, I'm on my lunch break. So that's why I can only join for a little bit. But I just wanted, again, just to say thank you. Thank you to all of you. And, and of course, to the Northwest Center for caring for my kiddos, both of them. I see, so I see, I see Asha, Asha and Jesse on, on here. And so, um, you know, they loved Kyle and Max and cute stories like Kyle would always call Asha Lasha. So he still calls her that to this day. Just all the teachers have been so wonderful to our family. And, you know, anytime you guys need us, you know, I will always say yes to you guys. Well, thank you, Christine. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'd like to now um, introduce the rest of our panelists that will be joining us today. They want to turn their cameras on. I think we're just waiting for Richard. Great. Okay, wonderful. So Jay Kim um, is the Information and Resource Coordinator at the Arc of King County. As a social worker who has a, development, a developmental disability, Jay also supports people with disabilities to lead successful lives. Richard Mullen. Richard is the Ad Outreach and Advocacy Coordinator for the Arc of King County. In his work, he focuses on bridging the education gap for people who are members of the disability and BIPOC communities. Welcome, Richard. Next is Carrie Fannin. Carrie is the Executive Director of the Children's Institute for Learning Differences, or CHILD. CHILD partners with school districts throughout Puget Sound to provide a, therape a therapeutic day school program for children with a variety of learning challenges. Asha Martin is a lead infant toddler teacher uh, for Northwest Center Kids Early Learning, and she's worked with us for the past 17 years. And on screen with her is Jesse Lemus. Jesse is a lead pre-K teacher for Northwest Center Kids Early Learning, and she's worked with us for 18 years. So welcome all. So my first question is for Richard. Richard, what have you experienced in your work with families or in your position at the Arc of King County that shows positive change in terms of educational resources for students with disabilities and their families? Um, well, what I've noticed is um, an increase in education and information. Um, working at the ARC of King County, we um, pride ourselves in being connectors. A lot of times we uh, have been contacted by families who are having various uh, issues in um, school systems, all across Washington, we do focus in county, but we calls from all across Washington uh, from parents seeking help navigating um, uh, solutions for their loved ones with physical and intellectual disabilities. 
capabilities. And I can say that um, there have been amazing parents and family members who have taken hold of the information that has been available, sometimes very little, and um, have risen to the occasion to advocate uh, and make sure that their loved ones have um, what they need. And so I feel that, that though, that's, that's great momentum as far as our community is concerned. I know that the African-American community specifically uh, in some cases has a lack of information. And so it's, it's really been encouraging to step in and provide information and resources so that they can be all that they can be within their family and community. Wonderful, thank you, Richard. That um, you, the work you do is so important um, and especially that the kind of connector piece that you're talking about, making sure that people um, not only have access to resources but are aware that they even exist. So thank you. Um, next, I'd like to ask a question of Carrie Fannin. Carrie, in your work with child, um, you have often said, quote, Children don't fall through cracks, they slip through fingers. What are some of the issues that you see in your work that make it difficult for children with disabilities to succeed in our current education system? Thank you, Laura. Um, I think I'll start with what I don't think it is. Um, I don't think that it's a curriculum that's being used or not used or how teachers design instruction. Um, it's rarely about what the classrooms look like or who is or isn't in the room. The issue that we do see a lot is discipline. Uh, more clearly, the adult response to children who struggle meeting the demands of a public school classroom. And I think a lot about how different the kids who come to see us today versus 20 years ago when my own daughter was a child. And I think the biggest shift that I've seen is that schools have gotten much better at working with kids whose disability you can see. And the gap that continues to exist really is uh, with those kids with neurodevelopmental disabilities or delays, whose way of coping with their environment at school gets framed under the umbrella of bad behavior. Um, that child were grounded in the belief that behavior is a clue, not the problem. And you know we serve children who struggle in both public and private schools and impact any classroom. So it would seem that there are similar responses within the education similar or system um, when we're talking about um, the kids who interrupt or distract or they're too loud or they're unable to shift when there's a transition. They're kind of our too much kids, but they're too intense, too hard to reach, too resistant, maybe too explosive. Um, the last 15 months of learning from home notwithstanding, uh, these conditions cross all boundaries. Uh, they disregard a family's income, level of education, their cultural beliefs, or the neighborhood that they're in. Um, it's about hardwiring, and neurology, and delicate emotional systems. And these are the kids that lose points and privileges, or face restraint and seclusion, all in the name of discipline. And what they have in common is the searing experience of failure in traditional school settings. Um, you know, this work requires us to be detectives. We have to be able to identify what's interfering with the child's learning. And when we do that, we can disrupt the cycles of school failure, school avoidance or refusal, dropout rates, restraint and seclusion, the school to prison pipeline, and the deep isolation and helplessness that families and children experience when things don't go well in school. So I think that, you know, when we focus on behavior or, or rather uh, on the result of a child's inability to adapt to multiple demands or sensory input or whatever it may be, we miss the point. Uh, we need to explore what thwarts, stops and blocks these kids. And our educators need the freedom to try on multiple approaches to discover what allows for engagement taking risks and learning. And I think we want to be a little further upstream to what's causing the upset in the first place. And when we don't, we have a short-sighted view of what's going on for these kids. 
Um, I think that our campus at Child provides a view into what's possible for these kids. And we are a living, breathing demonstration that there is a better way. Wonderful, thank you so much, Carrie. And unfortunately, we see a, a similar th a theme in the early childhood realm as well. So, All right, um, now I'd like to ask Jake him a question. Um, Jay, can you tell us about your personal experiences in the education system and what worked for you um, and maybe what didn't work quite as well? First of all, thank you for this wonderful event. I was in a Sakwa school district since fourth grade. The school that I was placed in decided to put me in a special education class, LRC2, and I stayed in LRC2 until high school. They didn't evaluate me based on my knowledge. They assumed that mm -hmm. I was able to learn like any other students due to my disabilities. Teachers had me play games or watch movies that were about life skills. I barely did academic work. I remember we had a circle time where we talked about things like which day was it. Although LRC2 taught me variety things such as how to be independent and do things by myself, I unknowingly lost a chance to learn and it feels like I have a hole in my education. When I got to high school, it was difficult for me to get used to LRCI and general education classes. LRCI is usually students with a learning disability or those who can learn but need learning accommodations. This environment provides students with supports, tech, books, aid, accommodations, etc. I had no idea how to be a normal student who does schoolwork because I didn't have a lot of experiences doing homework slash assignments. All I needed to do in LRCII was play games and daily life tasks with a little bit of practical life skills related academic work. Even though I went to regular classes while I was in LRCII, nobody really expected me to take tests or do assignments slash homework. I really didn't need to pay attention to teachers when they talked. When my specialist came to work with me, I didn't have to go to general classes or I could be late. I was mostly in classes like cooking or choir that doesn't require academic work, which wasn't helpful for a college preparatory track. I cried every night because I was flummoxed by everything that was going on in my classes and didn't know how to ask for help. I even didn't know how to write an essay when a teacher assigned one. Citing at the desk and listening to teachers talking for an hour was hard for me, too. Teachers kept giving me great numbers of handouts and asked me to do them. However, my transition specialist helped me to apply and get set up at Bellevue College, where I transferred from. My former transition specialist is the person responsible for opening another door in my life. At first, I wasn't sure if I could go to college and reach my dreams due to my disability, but I decided to face my challenges because of her. She always said I can do it and she did everything she could to open a path for me. She encouraged and believed in me more than anyone. She even put me in a history class with the hardest teacher in the school because she wanted me to challenge myself. At the time, I didn't understand why she did this to me, but now I appreciate her for giving me an opportunity to challenge myself. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing, Jay. Um, and it's so wonderful to see all of the amazing things that you're doing today, um, in spite of not maybe having all of the support and opportunities um, that you would have liked initially. So thank you. Um, next, my next question is for Jesse Lemus. So Jesse, in your work with Northwest Center Kids, what do you hear from parents when they're transitioning their children um, from Northwest Center to kindergarten or elementary school? And what have you learned about what works for them um, and maybe what doesn't work as well for them? Thank you, Laura. Um, I hear from families um, <clears throat> that families at Northwest Center receive uh, what, what we provide for them at Northwest Center is very difficult to replicate in uh, tw K through 12 because of the emphasis that we put on um, social emotional development using smaller class size ratios, parent supports, and social emotional curriculum, which is not always available in other school systems. 
Um, many families call on us for school age um, care because special needs kids have less after school um, opportunities and programs that can meet their needs. And we receive um, a high volume of referrals for children who need special needs supports. Um, frequently other child care centers call us and we cannot provide enrollment for everyone. And that's kind of the idea behind why we created the impact team. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, and you can stay unmuted because I'm actually, the next question is going to be for Asha. Um, so Asha, as you know, Northwestern's impact program uh, works with organizations throughout King County so that more classrooms can include children of all abilities. Um, from your perspective, why do you suppose so many organizations are eager to have this training and support uh, to be able to welcome children with disabilities? Well, uh, we as all teachers are here to teach children of all abilities and uh, not to turn any child away um, or any family away. Uh, so many organizations don't have the ability, knowledge, staff, or confidence in including all children. The impact team can work with teachers and administration in those organizations to help support how to talk with families with a child who may have special needs that these teachers are trying to work with and figure out what they can do. Um, talk with families about why inclusion is so important. Um, families of the whole center or whole organization on why it's so important that their, you know, general education child and uh, the other child are gonna be in the same room together and work together. Um, Impact team can support centers in implementing policies and classroom adaptations that promote in implementing inclusion, help teachers learn how to implement inclusion with a variety of materials to bring to the classroom, suggestions on what to do um, about a lot of the social emotional behavior, you know, that is happening that a lot of teachers are kind of almost at a loss because they don't know what to do, but they don't want to turn this child away. They want to help this child and this family. Um, they help everyone feel and be successful in everyday care and education. So many more children can have access to equitable education when we all work together for education for all. And I feel that is what the impact team is there for, is to go and help all these different organizations to work with the children they already have in their care or to be able to accept new enrollment, you know, of children that do need a little more help and things and how to do that and how it would look in their care and what even to say or, you know, have the knowledge or, you know, um, wording for it. So. Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you both. Um, and you, you know, you're, kind of tenure with Northwest Center, but your dedication um, to supporting kids of all abilities is, is so appreciated. So thank you both for answering our questions today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is for Richard Mullen. Uh, Richard, in your opinion, what's one thing that all of us could do to improve the future of inclusive education? Um, in my opinion, um, one, getting an understanding um, of the systems that can produce good fruit within the educational system. I uh, personally um, have created a um, group of individuals called the Hope Collective. How this, this group of individuals, it's parents with loved ones with uh, different barriers uh, and that, and they are in various systems, school systems and so on and so forth. But these individuals are interested in understanding how the legislative process works. Um, at the Arctic King County, we really, really believe that um, advocacy and information are the way forward. And so in this scenario, um, we are, it's a grass, grassroots group. We are unpacking uh, information in regards to how a bill is formed. Um, what are the ins and outs in, in various communities? This may not be common knowledge. And so um, I'm facilitating those groups and we are growing and moving forward and creating curriculum to share with the greater community. And we believe that if more individuals can have an understanding of how to advocate for themselves, how to 
take information and unpack it and understand it, then positive change can be a part of their reality. Wonderful. And I'm actually going to kind of stick with you and ask another question if you don't yeah, mind. I love it. Um, so in addition to advocacy, you know, being one of the really important um, components for families to have, I'm curious what you think um, are some additional barriers that people are facing still currently in our system today? Uh, well, some of the barriers, I would say, um, I'm just going to take it back to um, just having access to adequate information while navigating different systems. If we wanna talk about special ed, if we wanna talk about navigating IEP support um, within the school system, there are a lot of parents who honestly are uh, frustrated, lost, don't feel supported, um, and don't feel as though they are partnering with um, some of the individuals in some of these systems that, are, are, that should be there to help them along, help them up. And, um, and I just believe that if more parents can be informed and equipped going into school, um, especially in the African-American community, uh, that uh, we can see more, uh, um, just greater fruit, better, better outcomes. Um, and I don't just say this because I think this, I say this because I speak to families on a daily basis that um, come to me saying, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what questions to ask. I don't know what, how strong my voice is, where to apply my voice. And so um, what I've seen is in through time and relationship um, uh, and, and giving them what they feel they need and listening to them, right? Having humility, cultural humility, listening to them. I've found that we've been able to um, help them help themselves. And I think that that it is a key also uh, as far as moving forward, not just just giving information, hey, use this, here's a one page to do this, but listening, partnering, and then helping up and then they help themselves. And I think that helps the greater community as a whole. Those are such great ideas, um, Richard. And I think, but to your, back to your point about, um, you know, even the problem at hand, if the systems weren't so kind of complicated and convoluted to navigate um, in the first place, those might not be necessary. So I think you just highlight two kind of really important areas that we still have a lot of work to do in. Um, and that's something that you and, and the Arc of King County are, are working on every day. So it's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to ask Jay Kim a similar question. Jay, what would you like to see being done to advance disability education rights? If I could rebuild special education system, it would apply social model instead of medical model. It is an empowerment model that focuses on support and accommodations. Also, I would train the teachers how students should be challenged academically and learn with their peers in order to be as successful. Special evaluators need not to judge students solely on their apparent disability in evaluating students. If you would like to hear more about the models and stuff, we can go to your school or wherever and do our disability is diversity training where we discuss these things. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jay. And I completely agree. I'd love to see a system like that as well. Um, great. Well, now um, we are gonna take just a few minutes to answer some questions that we've received from the audience. Um, and any one of our panelists may answer the questions. So I'm gonna just over here in the chat, gonna take a look. Um, Have questions, go ahead and type in. Um, but while we're waiting, I'll actually ask Carrie Fannin um, another question while we're waiting to see if any come in from the audience. Um, Carrie, I'm just curious, um, now that you've seen, you mentioned a, a little bit about this before, but um, now that you've seen how successful inclusive classrooms um, can be at child, and that classrooms can be designed to fit the needs of all children. What are some ways that you think we can start bridging that knowledge to the reality of public school? Mm. 
So, you know, our, our public schools serve a large majority of the population very well. Those aren't the kids we're talking about, though, today, right? Um, the students that we work with at Child might be the ones in a school district or a school building, and they sure are coming to us because things are going well. Um, I also think, you know, inclusive classrooms at Child is a, a little bit of a misnomer. We certainly had very intentions design around our campus and our classrooms. Um, however, all of the students that are with us have an identified disability and all of them receive special education services. So I would actually liken uh, our, our environment more like what Christine had talked about uh, with us earlier and would be better described as self-contained classrooms. Uh, we don't have general education classrooms that children can come out of like they can at the public schools. But that being said, I think schools need more choices self-contained classrooms or new spaces and paraeducator support and classroom behavior is interfering with the ability to participate in school. And more than that, I think that focus is about real estate. And we could make a little with a shift in our thinking. Um, the wait and see approach, actually, wait and see approach, our children with disabilities over and over. We don't talk in terms of early intervention at child. What we are advocating for is clear intervention. Working with children in uh, or students in kindergarten gives them a much better chance to assess if they are in third, fourth grade, or older. Uh, these older kids now have a big dose of repeated school belts. And, you know, the of earlier intervention um, is that the joy of learning doesn't slowly wait and see. And so my call would be for a parent to deserve help before they fail, not when they fail or because they failed. Absolutely. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so one question that came up, and this can be answered by um, anyone, including Bill and, and Janet, um, is, is there any local or national legislation that's coming about that we should all be aware of? It's, it's been a very dry time for a momentous new legislation for individuals with disabilities. We're in, in, a, in a flat spot. We've got some tune-ups here and there, uh, but mostly we're, we, we're the little boy with the finger in the dike. We're trying to hold on to what we have right now more than anything else. And I think it's really incumbent on us uh, to maintain a, a watchful approach to what's going on in both DC and in Olympia uh, but I take off of some of the comments of the panel earlier. There are new things happening in special education, new approaches. Brain science is moving so quickly. Uh, I take off on Carrie's comment about uh, neuroatypical children and wiring within the brain. So many changes are occurring right now so rapidly in how to approach children that it seems to me we need to focus on implementing what we have before we start expanding to the next step. We need to focus on reading what the laws actually say because they address a lot of the concerns that are out there. Don't look at what the local district does. Look at what the law says and go with that. Thank you, Bill. As a follow-up, I'm just curious, um, because I, I think you're right, it does seem like there's a kind of a lull in, legisla in legislation right now. And I'm curious your perspective on why you think that is the case, even though clearly we have a of work to do. That was a little garbled to me. Could you do it again, please? Sure. Um, I was just saying, uh, you mentioned that there's a lull in legislation. There's not much going on right now. Um, and I'm curious from your perspective why that is the case. Um, if there's still so much you know, to be done, why do you think that there aren't more 
you know, bills out there and people kind of demanding continuous change? I, I, leadership. Um, it really comes back to Janet's comments. She was directly on point. There needs to be a consolidated approach with a single focus on that approach across multiple states with a single entity, whether it's an individual or an entity, coordinating that approach. Um, legislators for years have uh, uh, approached us by dividing the disability community and pitting one element of the disability community against the other and saying there's a finite body, a finite amount of money or service available for your entire community. Assuming that the quote disability community is homogeneous, it's not. We need answers that focus on individual solutions even as we look at broad scope legislation. And right now we don't have the leadership that is doing that. Great, thank you. And we do have a question from our audience that I'm gonna read aloud. Um, so this, so Liz says, please speak to services um, to children now placed in alternative schools who may also have issues with early childhood trauma use of marijuana or other drugs, um, how is the best way to integrate these children with special needs? So any of our panelists can answer this. Just a quick comment. The University of Washington has been studying both fetal alcohol and fetal drug syndrome yeah. extensively. And the approaches to those two causative factors in disability haven't resulted in a comprehensive or focused model of intervention. Again, it comes back to the wiring that goes on in the individual's brain that is disrupted by the substance that has been ingested either by the mother or the child. Uh, and it, this is an area where we have to learn a lot more and listen, uh, really listen to the families and focus on the individual child rather than on labels. Oh, good point. I'm curious, Carrie or Richard, um, if you have any insights on this question or have anything to add. Well, I've unmuted, so I guess I'll start. I didn't. I can't see if Richard is is on my screen or not. But I hesitated to answer this question only because, um, you know, by the time that children uh, end up with uh, a program like Child, we have such a narrow window of opportunity. Um, you know, there's there's an awful lot of school failure and mental health issues that it's kind of the old, which came first chicken or the egg, and we're not always able to even uh, unpack that. And I think, you know, that it, it starts with having a really strong partnership with families. Um, you know, and it's in some ways, it's a bit of uncharted territory with schools, because, you know, there's this, this old thinking of what happens in school happens in school, like we're Vegas or something. And what happens at home happens at home. But the reality of things is that they both squirt into each other. And, you know, having having a meeting of the minds with families and and not trying to do things in a silo, uh, I think, give us the better opportunity to to help address uh, some of these these pretty severe uh, and serious issues that our, our children are facing. Um, you know, when 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 they don't do well in programs like ours, um, it is very rare. I'm not even sure I could even think of anything off the top of my head where, where a child would go back into a public school and try again. They may end up in a residential setting. They may end up in a hospital. Um, it's, it's really, I think, going back to my earlier point that the earlier we address these things with our kids, uh, the better. So it's, um, it's not an easy it's not an easy thing, but I, I definitely think there's got to be a partnership between school and family. 
Um, I would say, first off, I'm not going to pretend to have the answer. So <laughs> I just want to put that out there. But what I will say is, is that um, I do believe that two things. I believe that education starts in the home first. And I believe that that influences how the youth uh, experience the world around them outside of the home. I also believe that support um, for uh, the children should start in the home. I believe when when facing some of the challenges pertaining to this question, um, is, is we need to find out and figure out a way to support families supporting themselves in uh, the home and also in the community and school. Um, I would say that that would be the pathway to a solution pertaining to the question that was asked. Absolutely, thank you both. Um, so there's this next question is for Janet, Bill and Dan. Um, question, curious about what kind of opposition you faced um, when you were putting the original bill through legislation, if any. Our opposition. Uh, we had some opposition in the legislature. Uh, uh, we would get a message that uh, there would be a difficulty in committee. And what we had going for us uh, was the fact that we had Governor Evans who would uh, hear about it and would get in touch with us, the six of us, so that we could rush to Olympia quickly. and. Uh, straighten out any problems that we might be having. That was so valuable. Um, strangely enough, we had opposition from the associate called the Association to Retarded Children, it's ARC today. Um, that organization consisted uh, mostly of uh, people who had children in institutions because that was at that time in history, the, the solution. And they, uh, the membership and the leadership, I, 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 let me correct that. The leadership uh, opposed us because they thought we were going to take the dollars uh, given to institutions and put them into our education budget. And we assured them that was not the case at all. We were going after education dollars. Uh, nevertheless, there was a difference in philosophy. The people who had their children in institutions were fighting for the institutions and they were in very bad shape at the time. And, and their fight was a righteous fight. But they also had the idea that those of us who were keeping our children at home and looking for a quality education program and a public school education, uh, they were convinced that we were wrong. And so we had a whole different way of looking at the issue. So what we had to do, we tried to make peace with, with that group, but we never did because they were raised in that time period and were told by society that you're unworthy that having a child with a disability is a bad thing. And we came into the generation where the Kennedys, President Kennedy had a sister who was quote, retarded. And so it became a little more, uh, a little easier for us because we now were recognizing people of quality. <laughs> who had children who had a developmental disability. That war did not cease. That war continued until today, really. And so I think that was one of the tragedies that we had in, in our effort. And today I feel badly about that, but we were never able to resolve it because that was so, that awful philosophy was so entrenched and, and so pervasive at that time that having a, a child with a disability was somehow a punishment for the parents. I, I, I don't pretend to understand why they felt that way because uh, I know that the generation I was in, thank God, we thought our kids were 
quite wonderful. Two, two well, comments to, to Janet. Number one, I just want to uh, acknowledge that that's no longer the approach or the perception of the ark. Uh, that was a historical perception. Uh, yeah. And she's right. Uh, they uh, did have that perception. The other thing I would say was that we weren't supported by the educational community. Uh, in 1969, 70, 71, we were opposed. This was uh, a group of wild-eyed parents who were doing something to the educational community. And they did not welcome this. And in many areas of the educational community, they don't welcome it today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, we're so, we're also grateful that you all stuck with, um, you know, with the, the path, uh, regardless of the opposition that you faced, um, because none of us would be here today talking about this if you hadn't. Um, so thank you. And I wanna give a, a huge thank you to all of our panelists, um, you know, for sharing your thoughts and your valuable perspectives and insights with us today. Um, it's truly been an honor to share the floor with you. So thank you all. And we have just a few minutes left, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Jean Bose to wrap up. Okay, great, thanks, Laura. I really appreciate it, and Emily. Um, again, on behalf of the Northwest Center, uh, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, so appreciate you sharing your wisdom and knowledge and, and your experience with us today. Uh, thank you to Senator Evans and Janet and Bill uh, for all of your thoughts and for all the work that you put in. I think it's a, a parent of a child with a disability. I am equal parts inspired by what you did and profoundly grateful. So thank you for all the work that you, you, you've done for us. Um, I also want to thank our moderators, so Emily and Laura, thank you uh, for, for your help today in putting this on. All of the Northwest Center staff, uh, too numerous to mention, uh, for all your help for today. And then C plus C also, thank you to you. Uh, Amy Harris, thank you for hanging in there for this entire time. Uh, Jerry Milhan and Hannah Guggenheim of Thriving Communities and Guggenheim Films. And finally, to all of you who joined today. So thank you so much for spending this much time with us. Uh, today was only the first of many conversations about and action required for inclusive education. So please stay in touch with Northwest Center. Uh, what can you do to stay in touch? First, you can visit us online at northwestcenter.org slash education for all. And we'll keep you updated on events and initiatives that you might want to join. Uh, next, vote for inclusive education issues. One's coming up on August 3rd. If you're in King County, we hope you'll vote to renew the best starts for kids levy. This levy funds our impact program, which has expanded uh, inclusive early learning to more than 21,000 kids in just three years. In early October, you can join Northwest Center Kids for the first annual Early Childhood Summit, uh, providing tools and best practices for inclusion. And you can find, again, more information at our website. And then last, uh, be sure to watch for the release of the Education for All documentary. So Northwest Center, just to describe what we're trying to do uh, in honor uh, and to include the legacy of our founding mothers is to create the world that we all deserve. And the world that we all deserve is a world where 100% of kids have equitable access to education and where the employment rate for people with disabilities is equal to the employment rate of the general population. Now, that, that's a pretty audacious goal and we understand that, but I wanted to come back to a couple of things that were said today uh, so much great, rich content that we share, but two things for me that really struck. One is the word politics. So this inclusion is a personal uh, and a human issue, not a political issue. And I would argue that everyone has a vested interest in an inclusive world, no matter which side of the political aisle you might sit on. So that's my first thought there. The second thing I loved was in this documentary, Education for All, was four moms who would not take no for an answer. So for you, uh, have a personal view on inclusion and, and don't take no for an answer. Whatever your uh, advocacy is going to look like, uh, please lean in and share that because that's what's going to provide the path north for all of us and create that inclusive world. So like our visionary founders before us, let's continue to work towards the world we all deserve. Uh, think of the world as, the, as it should be as a world where everyone is allowed to engage and contribute. Uh, irrespective of race, gender, identity, ethnicities, and abilities. Uh, 
thank you again for all your time today. Very much appreciated and enjoy the rest of your day.